Hi everyone, welcome back to Dr. Han's classroom. If this is your first time here, I'm Dr. Han and I teach full-time pharmacology in a U.S. pharmacy school. I run this channel to educate the public and as well as my students. So last week I made a video on the ivermectin meta-analysis and thanks to a lot of the viewer, I learned that this drug is now being included in the large randomized control trial run by the Oxford University. University. And this week, I would like to make a talk on focus more on the pharmacological considerations of ivermectin if it were to be authorized for treating the disease. Now, first, a very important disclaimer this video is for educational purpose only, and I do not make any suggestions for or against the use of uh, the ivermectin for the disease. So, without further ado, do, let's head to the talk. The first consideration is that what is the proposed mechanism of ivermectin as an antiviral? In other words, how does ivermectin beat the SARS-CoV-2 virus? In an early in vitro study done by the Australian group, it showed that ivermectin effectively reduced the viral load by 5,000 volts after 48 hours of treatment in cell culture. But credits of this paper were on the very high concentration of ivermectin being 5 micromolar that was used in the experiment. But very recently, a new review article was published to summarize the possible mechanisms of how ivermectin fights the virus. So notice when we are looking at an antibiotics or antivirals, we are looking at two sides of a story. First is how this drug interacts with the invading organism, and second, how does this drug interact with the host or human in this case. Now, in theory, any drugs or compounds that can inhibit the growth of the invading organisms, in this case our virus, and not causing too much toxicity to human can be considered as an antiviral drug. Let's first look at how ivermectin affects the virus. In the review paper, it summarized a few computer modeling studies showed that ivermectin can bind to the spike protein with high affinity. It also shows that ivermectin could interact with human ACE2 receptor, the receptor for the S1 domain binding, and also the TMPRSS receptor, which is the site for S2 subunit to fuse to into the human cells and gain subsequent entry. Currently, there are few antibodies approved to treat the COVID disease. Now, they bind to the spike protein, but, but unfortunately, they could lose their effectiveness very quickly due to some of the observed mutation happening in the spike protein. But a drug that can also add on human cell receptors could overcome the rapid mutation happening in the virus because our cells' receptors don't mutate as much or as frequent. Once the virus is inside the cell, its goal is to complete its viral cycle. In short, the review also summarized the finding on how ivermectin could bind to the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and inhibit viral replications. Ivermectin also appeared to block viral proteins such as these ORF38, NSP1, ODR6, and promote the release of natural antiviral or interferons within our cells. Now let's look at how ivermectin interacts with human cells. Many COVID deaths, particularly in the early phase of the pandemic, were resulted from cytokine storms or an overreacting immune response to the virus. And during that stage, an oral steroid drug, dexamethasone, has already been shown to decrease death in patients on ventilation because dexamethasone worked by inhibiting the immune response. 
Interestingly, ivermectin appears could also suppress the overreacting immune response by blocking the pathways in the NF-kappa B and MAP3 kinase. Now, these pathway blockades can lead to a decrease in the production of pro-inflammatory mediators and can stop the cell from progressing into cytokine storms. But what are the technical challenges that are leading to ivermectin's criticism. This relates to the concepts of pharmacokinetics that I teach to my students in the classroom. This relates to what our body does to the drug or ivermectin in this case. Ivermectin is known to bind tightly to a serum protein called albumin, a protein that holds tightly to the drug this drug will not leave the bloodstream. Only those that are in free form can leave the bloodstream and go to the site of infection and work as intended. These principles apply to all drugs. And second, currently the data on how much ivermectin reaches the first site of infection or the lung epithelial cells are inconclusive. Again, critics argue the amount of ivermectin that could inhibit the SARS-CoV-2 virus would never be enough in the lung tissue, though this could be overcome with a special formulation, perhaps using an inhaled form of the drug. The third consideration related to the drug is how it would interact with other drugs or the body. Let's first look back to the principal trial Oxford is running that currently allow ivermectin to be used in the investigations, and so far they've enrolled more than 5,000 volunteers from across the UK. And in their latest statements on testing ivermectin in the trial, they clearly say that people who are on blood thinning medication, warfarin, should be excluded from the study. But why? Old studies suggest that ivermectin appears to interact with clotting factors, but it does not appear to cause bleeding directly. But a more recent review case published in 2018 showed concurrent use of ivermectin and warfarin could lead to some toxicity. And so if ivermectin were to be massively distributed to patients, and particularly older patients who are on warfarin would likely need special considerations. And lastly, ivermectin is metabolized by the liver enzyme cytochrome P450-3A4. And by large, a lot of the drugs are also metabolized by the same enzyme. In particular, steroid drugs such as dexamethasone are also being used to treat some cases of COVID can induce the enzyme. Induce means making the enzymes to work harder and metabolize more drugs. This could lead to a decreased level of available ivermectin and may cause ineffectiveness. All right, so I know this is a very in-depth topic on what we currently know about ivermectin, and I hope the Oxford University principal trials could yield some very useful data in the near future, and I really hope that ivermectin could be used or authorized or approved in any cases for the treatment in the near future. That is all for this week, and if you find this video helpful, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and please also share this video. This channel needs your help to reach more people. So lastly, please stay safe and healthy, and I'll see you again next week for another episode on some COVID-related topic. Bye.